Okay, so good evening, everyone. We still have a few people trickling in. We're having a really good turnout tonight. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I hope you guys had a good 4th of July weekend. And before we get started, I would like to note that this program is funded by CAL FIRE and is one of several efforts of the Ventura County Wildfire Collaborative. You're going to be hearing from several other collaborative member organizations today. The Ventura County Wildfire Collaborative is a working group of several organizations across the county whose aim is to increase wildfire preparedness and education. Also, I would like to encourage you to feel free to use the chat feature to submit any questions you may have. You can also raise your hand and I can unmute you if you prefer to ask questions that way. You will have time for questions and answers at the end of each presentation. And there will also be a set aside time at the very end of the entire program for additional questions. Our speakers today are gonna to cover a variety of topics. We have the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council. They're going to be discussing home hardening. They're also going to be talking about community wildfire protection plans. What are these plans? How can they help your community? We're going to be hearing from the Ventura County Fire Department on the Ready, Set, Go pro program, as well as the Ojai Fire Safe Council. And they're going to be discussing prescribed grazing for us. So with that, Let's get started. Max, do you feel ready to go? Yeah, no, no yeah. doubt. Okay, awesome. Thanks, oh, just really quick before we begin, I do see a question in the chat. Is it possible to see a recording of the June 7th insurance presentation? There is, that is up on our YouTube playlist and I will put the link in the chat for that um, as Max is going through his presentation, so. You can take it away, Max. Great. Thanks, Heidi. And uh, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Max Young. I'm with the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council. I'm the lead wildfire safety liaison. Let me go ahead and share my screen here and we'll get started. Okay, so um, one of the programs uh, that the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council offers, uh, among many others, is Home hardening. So this presentation is going to be really brief, but it's going to give everybody a little um, quick version of what home hardening is, why it's relevant to homes in this county, and uh, a little basic how to do it yourself and how to find more resources that can help you learn how to go a little bit further. So first about the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council. Um, we do a lot. Um, we do community-wide uh, community wildfire protection plans, we do chipper days, we do a lot of education and outreach, just like what I'm doing here. And one of the things we do is we offer free home hardening surveys to those uh, homeowners throughout the county that exist in kind of elevated high fire risk. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that more. But um, this program essentially seeks to educate those homeowners that live in these areas to take steps on what they can do to lower their risk to a wildfire burning their house down, right? Um, living in this county, there's been a lot of wildfires and everybody has a different story relating to Thomas fire and Woolsey fire. So um, there are things that we can do and there's a lot of science out there that point us actually in the right direction of what is effective versus um, what to avoid. So first, what's more dangerous to a home? I love these slides because oftentimes there's a misconception about wildfire. Uh, so here we have a big picture of big old flames on a hillside there. And then this next photo is some little embers floating through the air. So one of the things that Cal Fire actually uh, has confidence in estimating is that approximately 80 to 90% of homes that are lost or structures that are lost in this state actually are a result of embers, um, also known as fire brands. But embers can go approximately one mile to three miles ahead of the actual front of the fire, which is which, which is what makes them so dangerous. You can have a, a fire that is running up the hillside, but really the embers being thrown off that fire could really reach deep into your neighborhood. So this is a little video 
to kind of get at that. It's really short, but basically at the national laboratory level, this is courtesy of the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety. We do, they do, they conduct a lot of scientific testing to research exactly what materials, landscaping practices um, lead to more combustion at the structured level. And so really they've been at this for a very long time. And this video is just meant to demonstrate that um, there's a lot of science involved in uh, researching what you can do to lower that risk. So what you were seeing was a simulated ember cast event. Uh, I believe that video is about 10, 15 miles an hour winds and ember is just kind of hitting that house. Um, but as we know with the Santa Ana winds in this county, we can get a lot uh, worse winds. So the bad news is that a home can be far from the wildfire and still burn. So that means that we need to do a little bit if we're homeowners living in this county, especially along that wildland urban interface to lower our risk and make sure that we're prepared for when that uh, next wildfire comes. The good news, you can take steps to protect your home. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm trying to get the word out about some of these ways that we know, and I know Ventura. Did Max freeze for anyone else? The defensible space to the actual structure itself and trying to essentially lower that risk. So right here, um, we have a nice little picture of a house, probably many scenes around this, this around the county. So we see some weeds, we see some wooden fencing right up against the house. And after kind of implementing some home hardening measures, which is kind of getting these weeds away from this wooden fencing, this wooden siding here along the home and uh, taking these landscape materials and trying to refurbish them such that um, the wildfire can't really reach the home. Now, this second picture also has wooden fencing attached to the home. And that's another probably be recommending that folks take that zero to five foot zone and replace that fencing with metal in the future. But um, again, this wasn't a lot of work, obviously, by the picture. And what you see here is just probably one weekend project of some sweat equity and some simple landscape materials that go a long way in protecting this structure right here. Okay, so the most vulnerable point, vulnerable point of any home is going to be the roof. And so um, as homeowners, it's, you know, really crucial and vital that you're taking that time, especially on a kind of regular basis to inspect your roof for those places that embers could get in. So looking for damage, looking for missing shingles, those gaps and vents um, that exist on your house, are they properly screened? Um, and are the gutters made of ideally non combustible materials? And if they're not making sure that you're routinely getting up there, if they're catching leaves and other leaf litter that comes onto your roof and clearing those out. So another component of home hardening really gets into the dispensable space and that's essentially taking those hazards that might exist around your property. Um, so right here pictured on the left hand side is a tree that's obviously in kind of declining health. And so what this creates, especially as it hasn't really been limbed up as it's called, um, creates a really great opportunity for a wildfire to um, start on the ground here and then move up into the canopy of the the tree, which really creates a dangerous situation. So it looks like this homeowner went ahead and removed that tree entirely. But um, vegetation management, and if you live in these extreme or very high wildfire zones, you're probably visited by Ventura County Fire Department every year. So this isn't news to you, but these same principles apply to the rest of the homeowners in this county too. As we know that one to three miles, um, most homes in this county are gonna be you know, within that ember cast zone. So, Structural weakness. Now, I've been doing these assessments just for a little while in this county, but what I've seen quickly is that one of the things that I recommend the most for homeowners is really easy, um, low cost retrofits. So, for example, this is just a picture of a vent that's hopefully exposed to the outside. And what I end up recommending a lot is folks just get some really cheap 1 8 inch stainless steel or metal non combustible mesh and just staple it around those vents that are exposed, especially those which are situated to catch wind or kind of out towards the open space. And that 
dramatically reduces the number of embers that um, could potentially enter inside of the home or the roof to ignite something while nobody's really home. Hopefully by that time you've evacuated. Um, and that's a really easy one. That's just a weekend project that you can knock out um, just a couple of hours. So this is a, a, a picture here from the NFPA. And this really illustrates what zones exist now. And the focus of my program and the home hardening program at the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council really tries to look at that immediate zone, zero to five feet um, at that laboratory level that I mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of the science is pointing us in the direction that if you keep that zero to five foot zone really clean and, and up to code with the, the regulations and the guidelines that you dramatically uh, reduce your risk for your structure being lost. Now, the two other zones of really important note as well are the uh, zone one, which is five to 30 feet, and then zone two, which is 30 to 100 feet. These often, the phrases around what the zones are called are um, kind of change, but we here in this county go by zone zero, zone one, and zone two but the feet is exactly the same, zero to five, five to 30, and 30 to 100 feet. So um, during a home hardening assessment, which uh, in a little while here, I'll go ahead and show how you might be able to sign up for one of these, but um, it's essentially a home visit. So one of our assessors will come out to your home and we'll go around the home with you, talking about what we're noticing, filling out our home ignition zone report, which will be given to you at the end via email. Um, in that report, we we try to take a uh, nuanced look at everything because I'll, I'll go backwards here for a second. But this picture here, while really great to illustrate the perfect example, it doesn't really look like any house I've ever seen in Ventura County. Um, so each house is different. Every person's recommendations that I might give to them are going to be different. Um, but we give those recommendations to you and then we hopefully follow up with you in a few months. But during that assessment, we give you all sorts of supplemental educational materials, everything from Ready, Set, Go, which Ventura County Fire is going to be talking about here in a little bit, to VC Alert, to even the Office of the uh, Insurance Commissioner at the state level. Just resources that we've learned over the years um, through our experience, uh, homeowners use and find quite useful. So all of the results from our home hardening assessments are entirely private. They won't affect your insurance rates. Um, we're a non-enforcement agency, so there's nothing that I can do that would get you ticketed or cited in any sort of way. And really, these are just meant to be a benefit to all these homeowners that exist in this county that are in elevated wildfire risk. So to do so, meaning how you can sign up yourself for a home hardening assessment, you simply just go to our website, which is VenturaFireSafe.org backslash home dash hardening. And right there, the first button that you'll see will be sign up for your free assessment. And we'll get back to you. And the way that we do things, found it the easiest, is that uh, you get to reach into my calendar and grab a time that works best for you. And on the day of, I'll show up to your house. Pretty simple. Um, we love that everybody can share this information with our neighbors. One thing that we know and is common knowledge is that your house is only as safe as your neighbors. And so, as we go around these assessments, oftentimes I'm a good uh, nonprofit employee and handing out lots of flyers for you to hand to your neighbors and um, trying to get you to talk to everybody around you because it's really important that as homeowners, we do this at the neighborhood and community level. Um, fires in this county especially have historically hurt and damaged communities wholesale because they start at one house and then they spread from there. So it's really important that um, you're working with your neighbors and sharing the education and knowledge that uh, reflects the science that we know um, to reduce your risk. So how to prepare you and your family for wildfire? I'm gonna kind of breeze through these. I believe we'll be touching on these in a little bit, but uh, the first step is to really um, understand how to be notified if there's a wildfire threatening your area. So in this county, we have a really great system. It's readyventuracounty.org slash VC alert. And this is the emergency notification system, which will text your cell phone. Um, and it's not taken very lightly. You will not get a lot of text messages. This system is reserved to uh, notify you when you need to evacuate or if you need to be ready to evacuate. So it's really crucial that everybody is signed up for VC alert. 
and then basically the the ready set go program so the ready portion is kind of get your house hardened and get everything dialed in such that when that time comes that you need to go you're not scrambling to try and uh, move things around the house the utmost importance is that everybody is leaving when they're told to leave uh, set or go kit familiarize yourself with your evacuation routes and then go act early and cooperate with all the local authorities everybody's trying to keep everybody safe and uh, get out the door with time to spare so if you want to learn more about this program in particular please visit our website follow us on social media you can email info at venturafiresafe.org or call this number 805-746-7365 with any questions and uh I'll kind of keep that part brief because I'm going to turn it right over to my other colleague, Kate Furlong, to talk about CWPPs. But first, I'll take any questions if anybody has any. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand or you can type it in the chat. We did have one question, Max, about um, any recommendations for coatings, specifically for wood decks. What would you recommend for someone with wood decking? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, for wooden decks, there are a lot of different dynamics which might go into that. So I, I would recommend reaching out to me directly, Max at VenturaFireSafe.org, and I can discuss um, what solutions are available because there are a lot of aftermarket products and they're difficult to navigate, but there are a lot of steps that one could take before going to gels and retardants. Um, but Simply keeping the deck devoid of a lot of combustible materials, especially underneath it. So if you're noticing during especially windy days that there's lots of leaves and leaf litter building up under the deck, well, that's a telltale sign. You might want to screen off that area of the deck where things are getting in and then making sure that the deck is um, well sealed and well maintained. Redwood decks are a bit out of fashion, to my understanding, in this county. I haven't seen a lot of them. and so. Um, if you do have one, making sure that you're keeping the wood happy, essentially, and keeping any kind of ladder fuels around it. Um, but I encourage you to reach out to me directly, too, and we can talk about that. We have a couple more questions. Um, people seem pretty jazzed trying to, trying to get some home hardening assessments, and they want to know how far backlogged are you for visits? Is this something they can do within the next couple of weeks, or are we looking a little bit further out? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, uh, we have about the, somebody in here was mentioning the KCLU interview, so we definitely got quite a few as of this this uh, Tuesday after that went up, but um, we're not backlogged past two weeks. So if you sign up with us online, basically you enroll yourself and then we'll get back to you after we kind of organize your information with that scheduling function and you can really choose a time that works for you so i have assessments people book three months in advance and then some people will give me week of and uh, susan's asking is non-combustible mesh available at most hardware stores fantastic question i'm so happy you uh, asked that susan but yes it is it's very cheap you can get a roll of 25 yards non-combustible mesh um, I don't think it costs more than $40. You can cut it out yourself and just use a staple gun. I, I really don't, I implore people to not go with anything too fancy um, as just that simple $40 product goes a long way. And the last question we'll answer right now and maybe Kate will be able to answer it because um, it has to do with your website. It says, why are the unincorporated county areas grayed out in fire hazard severity map on your website? Oh, that's a fantastic question. I, I'll probably take that, uh, Kate, but it's for no other reason um, than the fact that this map that you see on our website is uh, using the California state data. So we did not do that on purpose. Um, and we do use some other resources that we found um, to help us navigate those unincorporated areas. But if you're in an unzoned area, that's simply because in 2007, when the state made these maps for everybody to use, um, they did not finish the unincorporated areas to my understanding. But that does not reflect your capability of signing up for an assessment. Awesome. 
uh, Kate, do you feel ready to talk about community wildfire protection plans? Yeah. Okay, awesome. I'll hand it over to you. Bad boy. <laughs> All right, well, good evening. Uh, my name is Kate Burlong. I am the programs manager for the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council. Um, we had a little bit of a brief introduction with Max earlier. Um, fire Safe Councils, so we're grassroots community based organizations within the state of California. Um, they started about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago um, throughout the state. Um, and we share the same objective that we're trying to make our communities less vulnerable to catastrophic wildfires. So what is the Ventura Regional Fire Safe Council? Um, so we're a community-led organization that mobilizes and empowers our local residents to protect their homes and neighborhoods. And we do this through educating our communities, providing them with the resources and um, practicing preparedness activities with them. Um, we also partner with our local fire officials to design and implement these projects and programs that we have to increase the wildfire survivability of our communities. Something that we do a lot is we act as a conduit between the fire departments and the communities. Um, we work in a lot of vulnerable areas um, and we're also expanding a lot more into Spanish speaking neighborhoods. Um, so we're trying to kind of um, work together and empower everyone um, to reduce uh, the need for having firefighters come to respond by having more resilient neighborhoods. Um, the mission of our organization is to reduce the threat of wildfire to our communities through action, education, and collaboration. And our vision is to ensure that our local communities are fire resilient, safe, and prepared to withstand the threat of wildfire. So uh, Max kind of went over this a little earlier. Um, what do we do to help our communities? What does a fire safe council do? Um, our organization, um, we provide free community chipper programs and events. So this is where we go out into a neighborhood um, or, or into a park and we have people come and they'll bring their, um, their yard waste, their, they'll trim their own trees around their homes, help create their own defensible space, and then we'll partner um, with the group to then have free community chipper events. Um, we, so we also work with large landowners to create defensible space, and this is at least 100 feet out from the base of a structure. Um, we also do hazardous vegetation removal. Um, we partnered with an organization recently called Team Rubicon, which is a group of volunteer veterans that usually does um, wildfire response or emergency response, and now they're trying to turn towards more prevention. Um, so they kind of did a pilot program with us and we were able to help um, conduct some hazardous fuel reduction. This is mostly removing invasive species, um, creating spacing, lifting up ground, um, ground covers to reduce the spread of fire um, during a fire event. Um, we conduct our home ignition zone or home hardening assessments. Um, another program that we used to do is uh, creating these ranch plans. And this is where we work with ranch owners to help identify where um, important resources are within their property so that um, firefighters, when they are responding can understand where, like if there's a cultural resource or if there's a historical barn that needs to be protected more than other structures. Um, and also understanding where potential hazards are. A lot of these large properties are used for staging areas. Um, so understanding what resources are there and availability um, is also very important. Um, we conduct a lot of education. That's our primary goal of what we do is uh, try to empower um, our partners through webinars, for, um, really pushing the Ready, Set, Go program and also conducting a hired vendor training. Um, we do this program every year, which is where we, um, work with contractors that partner with CAL FIRE. Um, if they wanna be able to respond to a fire, they need to receive the, straight, the state training. Um, so we work with a partner to be able to provide that for local contractors as well. Um, and what I'm really gonna be focusing on is uh, our work that we're drafting the Countywide Community Wildfire Protection Plan update. So what is it? Um, we refer to this a lot as a CWPP. Um, so, 
this is a community-based plan that pretty much acts like a blueprint for wildfire management. This is where we identify and address what our local hazards are and what our risks from wildfires is. Um, we determine what's at risk, what structures, um, what resources are potentially at risk from wildfire based on their location. Um, and we provide a roadmap for different actions for the community to address these wildfire threats. So it's not just left on the fire department. There's a lot of things that we can all do and work together to chip away um, at our risks. Um, these key components that are required to create one of these plans is to um, collaborate, so we work with all different agencies, state, federal, local, um, community-based, um, different nonprofits, um, all sorts on um, this collaboration. Um, we really prioritize this fuels reduction. That's one of the major things. Um, these plans are actually a template that's through CAL FIRE and it is utilized by CAL FIRE for funding and to identify programs and projects. So we wanna make sure that we're, we're meeting all these key requirements to be able to provide um, funding for more projects. Um, and then we also uh, focus on the treatment of structural ignitability and that's where our home hardening really comes into play and reducing the ignitability of structures, especially within the wildland urban interface. There's a lot of different benefits towards a CWPP. Um, so they can open the door for a lot of funding opportunities to be able to fulfill these projects that are highlighted within these plans. Um, they help our community really form a relationship with the fire departments because there's more of a conversation of back and forward um, and other resource management agencies, like ones that do um, large land management, things like that, that are tasked with these hazardous fuels reduction. So people are more aware of all of the efforts that are being done. Um, Ventura County Fire is, is uh, incredibly proactive when it comes to a lot of these programs. And um, a lot of the times it happens outside of your general area or outside of your neighborhood. So you don't see it and you don't see all of this incredible work that's being done. Um, so it, it really helps kind of strengthen this relationship. Um, these fuels reduction projects, uh, they receive different priorities, they receive more priorities for funding, so we want to make sure that we're working together to identify areas. Um, a lot of these areas are also on private property, um, so that kind of limits and can also open doors um, for availability for these, uh, these funds. Um, it helps us gain more access to these networks, it shows like, hey look, we all work together, we've put in the due diligence, we know that we are, we have these X, Y, and Z risks. And this is what we're willing to do to reduce those things. And that is, um, you know, definitely respected by our grantors and um, by other agencies. You know, we are incredibly proactive in Ventura County and um, we do act as, as, a, um, as a good influence for a lot of other counties um, for a lot of the work that we do. It really helps facilitate our social learning, it, especially now that we're working a lot more with Spanish communities, trying to uplift and empower these um, neighborhoods that, that might have not felt included in uh, planning projects before or any kind of fire stuff before since they just weren't aware that there's stuff that's happening all around them. Um, and it helps spawn other projects and opportunities. So though it is focused on wildfire, they can have multiple benefits. A lot of these projects can have multiple benefits. They can help in floods, they can help um, in strong wind events, things like that. So I have, um, I'm kind of taking a different route that hasn't been taken before when it comes to updating um, a community wildfire protection plan. Um, and that's why I'm focusing on updating and creating these localized plans first to influence them. So this, this is how I am able to, um, include more individuals in the conversation, how I'm working to empower some of these groups, and then also helping identify things that, you know, sometimes um, could potentially get, get missed because you're not hearing that, um, oh, this community actually has a really hard time getting um, internet access. And if you don't have good internet access or good service, then we can't get our our emergency notices, you know, things like that, that, you know, people don't know to, um, to bring up to different partners. Um, so asking them these questions is really important. So I'm working with the city of Fillmore, um, with the two major land trusts that surround the city of Ventura. 
within the city of Ventura, um, the West Side Community Council, which covers the Avenue area, um, the Greater Ojai area, partnering with the Ojai Valley Fire Safe Council, um, working with the city of Santa Paula, Piru, Bell Canyon, which is a, a community that's just on the border of um, our county, Serrano County, which is also a county line. And then I'm utilizing all of this information and all of this representation to then work on this immediate update for the Ventura Countywide Community Wildfire Protection Plan. And the, la the last one was created in um, on March 9th in 2010. So as you can imagine, um, there's been a lot of changes with the fire regime management and even organizations that exist throughout Ventura County. Uh, I want to really want to try to push to make this document more of a living one. So then, you know, more people know about it. We've all had our hands in it. Um, and then we can actually utilize it. You know, we want to make sure that these plans get used as a blueprint so then we can be more proactive, we can get more funding, um, and it's constantly being updated. So I'm working with fire and police departments to be able to understand um, what our resources are and what their plans are, working with the Office of Emergency Services, working with different cities, agricultural groups, parks and recreation, land managers, transportation agencies for evacuation needs, different nonprofits and scientists for fuels projects, universities and state officials. So I'm trying to diversify the voices that are within these plans um, so it is representative. I also partnered with a, a group of master's students that were at the UCSB Bren School to create a management plan with the goal that we're trying to decouple vulnerability and marginalization when it comes to addressing uh, communication barriers, resource limitations, and create a more inclusive process when it comes to these kind of emergency plans. Um, a lot of it happens is that um, people of lower income end up being a lot more heavily impacted when it comes to um, large emergency events. And we really wanna try to decouple those two things to separate that, those facts and um, educate and include more people in the process to do so. Um, so we have different components that are within a CWPP. Um, so we try to focus on an overview of the area because these are used for grant funds. So we want to try to let our grantors know that aren't local. What are landscapes like? What's the topography? What's our fire history? Key infrastructure we're working to protect and then the, our current resources. Um, and then we want to go over what are our priorities, what our ongoing projects are and what our future plans to address some of our needs. Um, and that's through home hardening or structural hardening, defensible space creation, our fuels treatment projects, and evacuation planning. Um, so I'm, I'm partnering with a lot of different groups, as I was saying before. So for these components for structural hardening, I've created a, um, a best practices group that's with the Ventura County Fire Department, other local fire and city departments, um, the resource conservation districts, other fire safe councils, CAL FIRE, and the National Fire Protection Association guidelines. Um, we're trying to make sure that we're all saying the same message. This is something that's, it's a growing program. We're all expanding into doing more home hardening and I wanna make sure that our voices are being consistent across the board. And that we're also reflecting the needs that, that all of these valuable partners are seeing um, while they're going out and, and uh, responding to calls every day. Um, we're also for a defensible space. We're working with County Fire for the fire hazard reduction program standards and also utilizing Cal Fire standards for those as well. Um, fuels treatments, we try to focus a lot on brush clearance when it comes to the wildland urban interface. And that's where houses back up to an open area. Um, so that's what a lot of the defensible spaces and fuels treatments mostly works on kind of thinning out those areas that are extended. Um, and then we're also working on expanding into eucalyptus groves and addressing um, Arundo, which is a really flammable invasive that's throughout um, our river bottoms. And those areas catch on fire very frequently. So trying to address these different types of fuels and trying to modify what our real definition is um, to be able to uh, um, apply more funding towards these preventative projects. So then our firefighters can address um, other, 
other needs, we can do some more habitat restoration instead. Um, and then evacuation planning. So we're working with the Office of Emergency Services through the Sheriff's Department. That's who does all of our notices. That's who works for um, when it comes to evacuation. Law enforcement is the one that we partner with um, and our different transportation agencies um, to be able to identify um, uh, what resources we have available for people who don't have the um, reliable transportation uh, that others have. And then we're also utilizing predictive mapping um, to measure where there's potential pinch points. So when there is a fire, being able to identify other projects that we could work on to reduce those. Yeah, that's a, that's a little bit about a CWPP. Um, I'm going to be working um, more on updating more plans, creating more plans throughout the county. This is just our first phase. We'll have more grant funding that's coming in so then I can focus on some more localized plans. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that, you know, you guys know that I didn't forget about a lot of the areas throughout the county. It's just, there's only one me and I can only create so many plans in a short amount of time. So they're not forgotten. It's just going to be in the next series of updates. Thank you. So we have a couple questions come in, Kate. Mm -hmm. um, one person is wondering how these water restrictions affect fire risks. I'm not sure if that's a max question or something you feel comfortable answering, Kate. Yeah, so it, it, it all depends on the vegetation. Um, a, a lot of when it comes to when we're talking about home hardening, it, maintenance is a huge component of that. Um, I am a big proponent for native species. They require a lot less water. Um, it's all about spacing and your zoning. So you want to make sure you're keeping everything out of your zero to five, but um, you know, planting succulents and things like that, things, everything, every plant is flammable, right? There's nothing that's not flammable, um, but there are species that are drought tolerant and fire resistant that you can, um, that you can look up and uh, I think I might have some resources available that I can share as well, or I can have Heidi Ford in the follow-up. Um, yes, I mean, reducing the amount of that yield water will reduce the amount of hydration available for plants. So um, it, it could be time to switch out your, your garden. Um, I know there's a lot of rebates, especially for removing lawns. Um, throughout a lot of Ventura County. So if you're worried about your grass drying up, um, you can still try to capitalize on those and then be able to do a big restoration. The RCD actually has a really awesome demonstration garden um, outside of their office in Somis um, that, that demonstrates you know, different placements and things that's an ocean-friendly garden. So it reduces the need to water. Um, did that help? Yes, that's okay. it. Um, we had a couple other questions come in. Let me check the chat really quick. Uh, can a CWPP help motivate a neighboring property owner to keep the emergency exit from our mobile home park clear there in the greater Ojai area? Um, it's definitely a concern that we that should be addressed within um, the local CWPP. Um, being able to evacuate is one of the um, one of our topics that we cover. So um, that, this is important for the community outreach section or um, component of this is understanding. You know, um, well, if it's if it's talking about motivating a neighbor from not blocking an emergency exit, that's more of a law enforcement thing um, than than a community wildfire protection plan. But identifying that that risk um, is, is really helpful as well. Um, because if it is something that would require a project, like uh, are they uh, parking there because there's no other available parking or um, trying to address what the actual cause is. But a lot of that seems like it's, um, because it's an emergency exit, it would be a police department and also a potential fire department to address that. Okay. Um... We'll do one last question. We'll try to answer the other ones in the chat. Um, I have one question for you, Kate. Does a local community level fire safe council qualify the homeowners to receive a discount on their fire insurance premiums? So um, to, 
to be able to receive the discounts, you would actually have to become a FireWise community, which is different than a FireSafe Council. Um, there are, are specific state standards that you need to meet. Um, a lot of them are very similar. You have to create something that's very similar to a board. You have to create a plan. Um, you have to educate your community about said plan. Um, there is a FireWise community in Matillaha Canyon. Actually, it's one of the only two FireWise communities in all of Ventura County. But that's something we're definitely trying to encourage more of. Um, we are partnering with the um, uh, an organization called United Policyholders, which is helping negotiate um, some of these issues with insurance companies, with the state insurance commissioners, to be able to um, help protect uh, homeowners um, uh, from losing their insurance. But I would definitely recommend looking up a um, uh, FireWise communities for that need. Okay, thank you. So um, just for the sake of time, I do want to make sure that we get to the next speaker, but we will be trying to answer any questions in the chat. And if we somehow miss you, maybe at the end, we'll have additional time for any other questions. But Brian, are you ready to go? I am ready to go. Um, just for the start, I put in um, a lot of links and some, a lot of information in the chat function. So you can go directly to the links I'm gonna talk about uh, so we can kind of save time. Awesome. Uh, with that, we're gonna go straight into showing a little ready, set, go. So super nice that uh, we talked a little bit, a bunch of uh, Ready, Set, Go program stuff already. So we'll go into a little more information about it. Uh, this is our Ready, Set, Go packet. Uh, the first link you can see that will take you to all this information. Uh, so as I go through it pretty quickly, uh, again, you'll be able to get back to it from our website. Uh, so we talked about it about a little bit already about your defensible space and what that means to you. Um, so when you're looking at your home, uh, it's those defensible space areas. You know, they talk about the five feet. Uh, we want no combustible material around your structure. Now, when you're doing dispense defensible space, if you have a property that your vegetation goes up against your neighbor's uh, structures or within those areas, within 100 feet, you have to clear your vegetation to protect your neighbor's home. So it's gonna be the homes and infrastructure Infrastructure is going to come into place if you have propane takes. Uh, you need a clear area around your propane, uh, as well as solar. We're starting to see a lot of solar panels that are out in the um, away from our homes. So again, we have defensible space that needs to be cleared around those uh, materials. And unfortunately, if your neighbor puts solar panels next to your property line, you have to clear your vegetation within the proper uh, square footage from those solar panels. Uh, so we talked about it a little bit earlier. I liked the picture that uh, Max shared. Uh, the one thing that I would also add into that, the garage that he showed uh, didn't have the five feet clearance around it. Since it's a built structure that has the four walls that has something that could be uh, a considered a structure, that would be the five feet clearance around that. Then it would be a hundred feet from that structure as well. Uh, so you can see the picture I have here in our, in our uh, is a little bit older, it only has the two zones. Uh, the new state criteria coming out is gonna have um, an increased zone, zone engine to it, as well as like Max talked about, uh, it's spreading, these we're seeing embers spread a mile, mile and a half into the, um, <clears throat> further away from these, we call it an open space. So it's where the vegetation, can make large runs, it's gonna be the hillsides. That's an open space. If you're within uh, criteria of that, that's kind of how the state is dictating where the zones for severity zones are at. Uh, luckily, the state is working with individual counties and jurisdictions like they are with us, and they are, were able to modify those zones based on what we know the critical fire zones are within that area. But uh, as far as ready, set, go, uh, Max talked a lot about the hardening of the home stuff. So we don't need to go into that too much in detail. 
Um, they have a great uh, program that can come out and assist you looking at your house, as well as you can always call your local fire station and have them come out and give a real quick look at it. Um, and what, uh, by doing this to your home, by preparing your home, hardening your home, uh, reducing your brush and vegetation around it, it doesn't guarantee your house is safe, but what it does, it gives the firefighters an opportunity and a chance to save your home as well as your neighbors. Uh, so like we talked about the roofs and the eaves, fence, uh, the types of material that's on the side of the walls, uh, windows and doors. Uh, we didn't talk too much about the windows and doors. Uh, when you have your windows, uh, we wanna see on the inside of your windows, we don't wanna see light, loose, uh, flammable curtains. We'd rather see something that can withstand some heat from that that's gonna come from the outside because we don't want that uh, convective heat to be pushed from the outside flames through the windows into the inside to start a fire. So we wanna see non-combustible material right on the inside of those windows. Uh, balconies and tech and decks, we talked about those a little bit. Um, again, you want to, you don't want there to be a space on the bottom side where an ember can get underneath it uh, and start a fire under your deck and spread to your home. So seal up the underside of your decks, uh, make sure there's no uh, vegetation underneath it, no weeds. Uh, nothing that's going to make a fire spread under your deck into your home. Uh, and a real, a real simple thing to look at when you're hardening your home is where you see a collection of leaves and dust. That's the same place where the embers are going to be blown because that's what's happening. The wind is blowing those leaves and dust into those corners. That's where you're going to see the embers. That's where you don't want to have anything combustible stored. You don't want your chairs that are combustible in that area, because that's where the embers are gonna be blown as well. Um, we're not gonna talk too much about this slide because again, Max talked about it a little bit, or, uh, most of it already. Uh, his slide dictated very well. When you're looking at this home, there's nothing combustible around it. Uh, and there's a lot of concrete. We know we don't necessarily want all concrete, um, but again, that is non-combustible materials. see. All right, so get ready. Um, when you're getting ready, you want to not just harden your home, you want to get yourself ready. So create a family disaster plan. So that disaster plan isn't just for wildfires, it for like uh, Heidi mentioned earlier, floods, earthquakes. Uh, within that, you want to have a, a go bag for you and your family, which includes the six P's of preparation, uh, you want to have all kinds of medications, any kind of medications for family members that you might need to assist uh, later on uh, or for your pets. Make sure you include your pets in that. Have uh, food ready to go. Uh, if you have dry, dry food for your pets, uh, have that in your go bag as well. Uh, but remember, when you have food in these bags and you have to change it out. Um, so we talked a little bit uh, about registering on VC Alert. Uh, VC Alert is a great program that uh, it allows you to uh, sign up for notifications. Now, what it doesn't sign up for notifications based on your GPS of your cell phone. You add the addresses. So me personally, I have my home address. I have my child's school. I have my child's work and I have my workplace. So that way, if anything happens around those areas, I am find out about it as well as my kids get notified about any kind of emergencies. Uh, now it's not just evacuations. We could be asking you to shelter in place, which means there could be a gas leak. So you could get an alert that, hey, you know, we want everybody in this area to stay in place. And like they mentioned earlier, it's a great program that is not used very often. We want to be very diligent about how we, how many alerts we put out on it. So uh, we have the county section, we can make boxes within it that one side of the street will be getting evacuated, but the other side may not because we don't want to put out so many alerts that so many people get kind of tired of hearing these alerts. We are very diligent on when the alerts go out and who they're being sent to because we want to be able to manage traffic jams on people getting out and evacuating. 
uh, and the Office of Emergency Services, they're the ones that coordinate with the instant commanders on having those alerts go out. Uh, so again, still getting ready. Uh, make sure your whole family knows your evacuation routes. If we are in a high fire danger time frame, uh, back your car into your driveway. Uh, if you start to see smoke and you're feeling ash and smoke come down on top of you, then I would recommend, you know, if you're not sure, you're following us on our Twitter page, again, in the chat at VCFD underscore PIO, and you're seeing the maps of where the fire is heading, you don't have to wait for us to tell you to evacuate. If you have someone who's going to be a little bit slower to get out of the home, you have many pets to get uh, loaded up. Start getting loaded up and go grab lunch somewhere. Get out of the area. So much easier to be out of the area and know you're safe and not have to worry about being in, in the area. Uh, that way you're not breathing the smoke. Uh, if you have someone who has medical conditions, you can get them out early. Uh, if you have uh, somebody, if you're like somebody, you have a lot of uh, large animals, it's going to take a while to load up some of the horses and the larger animals we have, get them loaded up early, ease their minds by get, getting them in the rig and getting them going. Um, talks about uh, our program has a bunch of different things uh, to talk about, different evacuations routes, uh, have an emergency meeting locations. If your children are older or your family's older, and they get evacuated, well, where are you gonna meet? So, well, you know what? We, we feel like we wanna to go to the town center. We know that wildfire is not gonna affect that area, we'll meet there. Um, so have that all set up and it, it's going to ease a lot of people's minds about, and a lot of family members' minds about emergencies when they happen. As the fire starts approaching, uh, have a checklist set up. So that way, you, know, you wanna shut, shut all your windows and doors, uh, leaving them unlocked. So that way firefighters can get into the house, uh, put any kind of embers out or any fire that may have gotten into the house. Uh, when we evacuate an area, we lock down the area and we have uh, law enforcement there with us to secure the area the best we can. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, removing flammable window shades, um, any kind of flammable furniture should have already been moved away from uh, the exterior house, but anything that could be vulnerable to that heat on the inside, move it away from the windows. You have heavy, bl heavy blinds, close those so that convective heat doesn't come in. Uh, we're recommending that you leave uh, some of your lights on so that way under smoky conditions, firefighters can see your home. Uh, shut off your air conditioning. We wanna do that because we don't want the smoke to get sucked into your home. Um, we talked about the outside checklist a little bit. Uh, leave your exterior lights on. Do, do not leave your sprinklers on or running. Uh, especially now that we're in a drought, what ends up happening is if everybody turned their sprinklers on, the firefighters don't have water pressure in the system to fight the fires. So we recommend not turning on your sprinklers and not leaving any kind of water running anywhere. Um, we talked about backing your car into the driveway. See, if you are trapped, some of the survival tips, uh, shelter away from the outside walls, uh, bring a garden hose inside so the embers don't uh, where they won't destroy them. So you unscrew them from your water, water valves and bring them inside. So that way you'd be able to get back out afterwards. Uh, and again, this is like, if you happen to get trapped, you, you weren't able to escape. Um, let people know where you're at, let the firefighters know that you are trapped in there. And if we're able to get in there, we will get in there. Uh, go, uh, go early. We talked about going. We talked about VC alert, getting the notifications that you're being evacuated. Uh, again, you don't have to wait for us to tell you to leave. Uh, if you hear, if you aren't following us on Twitter, you didn't get the VC alert, and you hear the siren come down the street with the blow, with the bullhorn telling you to get out and leave, don't hesitate. Get out and leave. We're trying to get uh, everyone evacuated quickly. Uh, we don't always have time to go door to door, uh, so we try to get through it real quick with the uh, the siren and on our air horn, uh, law enforcement's again going to be assisting us doing that, but go early, especially if you're going to have any kind of thing that's going to be slowing you down like we talked about before. Emergency supplies. Um, talked about having a go kit and anything that you're going to need for you to survive for at least three days. Uh, and again, this is not just for fires. It could be for any kind of emergency. 
Um, so have a bag ready to go, have people know where it's at so you can grab it, uh, all those important documents, um, map marked with your evacuation route, uh, eyeglasses or contacts, sanitation supplies, anything that is gonna be particular for you and your family to survive. Uh, in the back of this book that you can get from our website, you can write down uh, emergency contact information, where it's school and work, all this kind of information. Yes, you can have your phone, but phones work off of batteries. And if there happened to be a power shut off and you didn't have your phone powered up enough, you might not have the ability to check this information. Have it written down in your bag and make sure you update it from year to year. Uh, again, in the back of the book, we've got a quick little checklist that you can go through to help protect yourself and your family. And I know I went through that super fast. Uh, so let's go ahead and see if we got any questions. Okay, we did get a couple questions in the chat. Um, Someone was saying they're not really on social media and they have had a lot of trouble trying to find current news on fires. Um, do you have any good suggestions for websites or so if they can get up to the minute notice? I totally get you're not on social media. Uh, if you're in Ventura County, you can go to our website. And I put that link when I first started at vcfd.org. And it's uh, active calls will be the link. If uh, you just go to our website, upper left-hand corner of the website, active calls. And you can actually follow our Twitter page and information happening there, uh, as well as there's a Pulse Point app. And that Pulse Point app is you can listen to our uh, command traffic about the major information coming, going on within that incident. Um, Brian, I'm not sure if this is in your wheelhouse. It probably is. Um, someone's asking, will fire hazard clearance notices continue throughout fire season? Uh, no, they do not. Uh, so, if you got a notice about your FHRP, Fuel Hazard Reduction Program, that you needed to clear your brush, you were one of the uh, little over 18,000 residents that uh, were, are within that zone that needs clearance, uh, June 1st is your deadline to have that cleared. I want to say we're at about 82% of uh, lots that have been cleared and are um, good, but that means we still have uh, a few thousand that need to be uh, need additional work. So only if you need additional work will you be hearing hearing from us again. Uh, but I do know that next year the state is going to be enacting new clearances like Max talked about earlier with uh, the zero clearance zone, uh, the different severity areas. So you could be in a high severity area, moderate severity area, or low severity area. We're going to start sharing information so that way people who are in those new zones and those areas will get will be able to understand what's going to be happening January one. Awesome, thank you. Um, there is another question that maybe is best saved till the end because this might be something that the Fire Safe Council will know a little bit more about about offsetting the costs and incentives for rerouting pool water to a sprinkler system. Um, have you run across that, Brian? Um, pool water. so the thing is, if you're using the sprinkler system for, for what purpose are you, if you're using it to reroute it for a, uh, a encroaching, encroaching fire and a fire sprinkler system, uh, I have heard of that. Um, but systems like that are very difficult to use based on when the approaching fire front is coming. Uh, so how does it get enacted and how does it get turned on to go? Because if it's going to be coming up that close, you're going to be uh, evacuated. So you can't turn it on. If you turn it on too soon, it's not going to work. Because pre-treating a home and covering it with water, as the wind comes through and the heat, it dries it out and it's going to be wasted and you're going to waste all the water in your pool. So uh, if there's a way for it to get turned on as the flame front hits, encroach, encroaches upon your home for your fire sprinklers, then that might be what they're talking about, but I don't know of any kind of systems that are set up that intuitive just yet. Okay, thank you. 
So with that, we're going to go to our last speaker. It's going to be the Ojai Valley Fire Safe Council. They're going to be talking about prescribed grazing. Christopher, are you ready? You're muted, so there you Yours go. now? Yep, thank oh, you. There we go. So the next miracle will be if I can share the screen. How's that? So um, let me introduce myself. I'm Christopher Danch. I am the executive director of the Ojai Valley Fire Safety Council. Joining me is Michael Like, who is our co-director of our prescribed grazing program. Uh, our other co-director, Brittany Cole Bush, or Cole, uh, is not going to be able to make it, as so often happens with grazers. She is stuck in the field, <laughs> so she can't make it. So bear with us as Mike and I improvise the sharing of the slides uh, that we have prepared for the three of us. Okay, let me um, find out how to advance this thing. Just very briefly about the Fire Safe Council. Oops, how do you go back here? Hold on. Just very briefly on the Hawaii Valley Fire Safe Council. We've been here since uh, just over 2000. Uh, we have done a wide variety of projects uh, and have built up a lot of online resources, We've done a lot of the same work that Kate and I uh, was talking about for the Venture Regional Fire Safe Council. We've worked together for uh, a long time and built up many local partnerships. Now, Ojai Valley uh, in, the, in the greater Ojai Valley area, as you can see from this map, is a uh, poster child for a high risk wildfire area with, uh, with lots of uh, homes and structures within the wildland urban interface. And we have pretty much everything it takes to make a high risk area. Uh, in fact, in a study just done by Headwaters Economics, uh, Ojai Valley is in the top 1% of the nation and the top 3% for the state. So we have lots of concern in our area. Um, for many years, we have done much of the same kind of work that Venture Regional and other fire safe councils have done uh, following the Thomas fire. Uh, the fire safe council was approached and said, can we build in more community capacity to actually prepare for, respond to, and recover from a catastrophic wildfire? Uh, as the one that uh, the Thomas Fire was for the Ohio Valley area. So with some funding from this, uh, the federal government and from Southern California Edison, we undertook a year of planning, developed a roadmap. Uh, in our second year now, we're starting to fund and implement priority projects. Uh, and of course, our roadmap will be integrated into our own CWPP that Kate mentioned. So we during this uh, planning process, we had a working group, we had public surveys, uh, we had uh, people come in and work with the working group. And so we developed a list of, of uh, priorities. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this. Um, but what we did was identify uh, a number of priority projects to start with. The ones you see in yellow are funded and starting now. Um, and you'll see at the top our community supported grazing program, which we're going to talk about today. I also want to mention, though, that we're also part of the Ventura County Wildfire Collaborative. Uh, we, along with Ventura Regional and Ventura County RCD, uh, are founding members of that collaborative. And so we I just want to point out that we, and you're going to know more about this later. I believe there's an upcoming speaker in this series on the Wildfire Collaborative. So I won't spend any time on it, but I just want the, the, the listeners to know that there's a high level of co collaboration and coordination in the county. Uh, and this is a, a, one of our centers of that. So moving on to our community-supported prescribed grazing program, which is one of our flagship programs here. And my, I'm gonna, I do want to start, though, because I forgot to put in the definition of prescribed grazing. So I'm going to give you a one-line description of that. I'm going to hand it over to Michael here. Uh, and that is, unlike grazing animals for livestock production, prescribed grazing is entering into a prescription for a piece of land where those animals are used as tools to uh, do uh, identified land management goals. And in this case, in wildfire, that's principally fuel reduction. 
So is that is that correct, Michael? That's a good definition. <laughs> okay, so then I'll hand over to Michael uh, to talk about the grazing benefits in Ojai Valley. Let's go. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So there's um, there's probably a lot of people watching from all around the county, <laughs> but prescribed grazing, uh, the benefits of it uh, apply uh, all around. We're working on this flagship program in the Ojai Valley with a transferable framework to hopefully be able to uh, create this replicable model to have a community supported grazing program uh, everywhere eventually that there is a fire safe council. Um, specifically the benefits of prescribed grazing or targeted grazing um, is fire fuel modification, fire fuel reduction, um, but there's also uh, secondary and tertiary benefits um, it can actually increase the soil carbon and more soil carbon. It, it acts like a sponge in the soil, which can increase the water infiltration and water retention. When you have more water in a landscape, you have higher fuel moisture content. And with a high fuel moisture content, you have a slower, uh, less aggressive rate of spread with wildfire. Um, even uh, land that's grazed uh, not during fire season, if you're grazing it uh, late in the season and you get another uh, rain or two after that and you have new vegetative growth, that, reg that new vegetative growth is going to be greener longer into the year. Um, and when it dries down, it's going to dry down later in the year. And so you'll have a lower fuel moisture. Um, in the picture up here, you can see uh, uh, our electric fencing that we use. And on the left, it has been grazed. And on the right uh, is full of standing uh, carbon uh, that is easily combustible. There have been many uh, examples. My favorite one um, at the Reagan Library uh, in Simi Valley, where prescribed grazing has saved structures and communities, we've seen often wildfires burning right up until the fence line that had been put in uh, weeks or months before. And a herd of two to 400 or a thousand grazing animals came in and took out all that fuel. And when the wildfire came, uh, the structures were not threatened. Let's see what slide we have next. I'll take this one. Uh, one of the differences of our program is that as a is as an implied in the uh, uh, title of community supported, we're having a multi-stakeholder approach. So it's more than just an agency working with individual landowners uh, as funding is available. That's a good program that's used all around the, the, the state and elsewhere and is growing in its use. But our approach is to more fully involve of uh, a whole diverse range of stakeholders uh, that can help to, to have, spread the program and to learn from the program, benefit from the program, and also help us and fund the program. Uh, so by going and using this multi-stakeholder approach, we're looking at much more diverse sources of funding for this uh, and ways of scaling up the program that otherwise couldn't be realized. Um, of course, the downside of a community sport of grazing multi-stakeholder approach is that it's very complex. <laughs> so it takes a great deal of management effort, outreach, and education uh, to, to move in this direction. And here's just a picture from our, we, had, we launched the program last year. This was uh, a stakeholder convening that we had, uh, and I believe Heidi was there. Uh, and... Um, we had a demonstration of the grazing animals that are being done uh, near the event site. And so the photos taken from that. And then we also had uh, this year, our main program so far in terms of uh, planning and development was our first planning summit. Again, I believe Heidi was there. <laughs> so uh, here's our grazers from uh, Ventura in Santa Barbara County. Uh, and the planning summit was a success. And we brought together a, a, uh, experts and people experienced from around the state to look at how do we scale this program up and how do we sustain this program and how do we begin to put together this transferable framework to help other communities uh, learn from what we're doing. 
And then we have a second one being planned, a date to be determined. Um, this one is more actually working with the key stakeholders uh, and building on our regional coordination and formalizing some of our partnerships. And then we have continued program development and um, that I'm not gonna go into detail on this, but we're looking at the various ways of scaling the program up, looking at how we utilize a programmatic uh, SQL, that would be the Cal BTP program to streamline our, our uh, environmental compliance and also the various legal structures that are being looked at. So again, the program is complex uh, and those ongoing uh, planning and development efforts um, are moving. Our next steps also is to um, look at other ways of fundraising beyond the current grants that we're going after. Uh, and uh, that is something where we're partnering with the Community Environmental Council up in Santa Barbara and working with them. Uh, we're also working with them on regional coordination. And we're also looking at mapping the corridor, which oh, just a thing, we had a nice 4th of July parade. Uh, and so here is our uh, animals led by Michael and Cole. Uh, it was a big hit. And uh, so I just had to throw those pictures in. So with that, one of our main uh, as goals of this project is what we're calling a wildfire intensity reduction zone. And I'll have Michael describe that. So here you can see our area of interest around the Ojai Valley. And the theme of this map is we're basically surrounding the wildland urban interface around the Ojai Valley. Um, and and that, that's what you would want to do in, in any municipality that borders the wildland urban interface uh, from a prescribed grazing perspective is you want to look at where the fire is coming from and can we, with grazing, reduce the fuel loads so that it can give uh, first responders a little bit more time to prepare. And so, you know, when we talk about it, what is a wildfire intensity reduction zone and not to repeat what Michael just said, but through this prescribed grazing and the fuel reduction through prescribed grazing, we're looking at a reduced ignitability of those fuels, looking at reducing the rate of spread. So giving our first responders more time to get in there before it spreads to the chaparral, because it often starts in these flashy non-native grasses. It reduces the flame heights, which if they're too high, the firefighters can't have access. And through the utilization of this contiguous corridor will help improve access for our firefighters. Why don't you take this? So another uh, benefit of the prescribed grazing is that it can actually increase the quality of our watershed and increase ecosystem function. And so as we're grazing for fire fuel reduction, uh, like I sort of mentioned earlier, we can increase uh, water infiltration, mineral cycling, all these things that can lead to more biodiversity, uh, better uh, water quality. And we're contributing to the food shed because um, a lot of the lamb uh, that's produced here uh, can be found at local farmers markets. Uh, and also the, the economic uh, development of these uh, targeting operation, uh, targeted grazing operations um, are increasingly employing uh, more people in our community. So some reasons to uh, graze the Teague watershed or the Casillas open space lands. Uh, obviously, as Michael just talked about, wildfire safety and resilience, watershed restoration and enhancement, but also other reasons to do it include the fact that in order to do the corridor uh, and do it as a, as a contiguous thing and look at the targeted acreage that we're looking at down the road in a couple of years of four to five, 6,000 acres annually being treated by prescribed grazing, the way to re one of the ways we are working to reduce the cost of that so it becomes more affordable and we can do more of it is to provide basically a continuous grazing with a standing herd here in the valley. Uh, and we need that off season pasture land to allow that standing herd to reach the size that's necessary to look at the uh, acreage that we're targeting. 
Uh, unlike uh, weed whackers and mowers, you just can't turn these things off and put them in the garage. So the animals have to keep moving across the landscape. And I think it's a good time to mention that this is part of the program is in scaling up is how to reduce the cost of the grazing, both to the landowner and the cost of doing business by the grazer. Uh, because while it can, it's very effective, uh, it is also can be very expensive. And so having a, a corridor, for example, provides the, if it's when we're successfully have this continuous corridor, it's going to greatly reduce the mechanical transportation of the animals. So the loading and unloading and the transporting of animals is very expensive and time consuming, also goes to uh, increased emissions. Uh, so having the animals dropped off one place and go, go through a continuous corridor and reach the other end greatly reduces that cost. We have other ideas like uh, tool lending program for the for small to medium sized grazers to reduce their um, barriers to entry in terms of capital investment and other such things. The watershed also is a uh, great thing for public awareness and education, research and fundraising, and to facilitate economic development uh, in the area, which is both good for the regional agriculture, but also the building of such a local food and fiber sheds is gonna help sustain the program. And, what we're, and I'll have Michael describe the white paper that we're uh, now seeking funding for, we should know any day uh, on one of our grants with the State Coastal Conservancy, but Michael? So we're, we're looking fund it for funding to uh, create a white paper that's going to study the effect of prescribed grazing in watersheds so that we can then go to our state and federal government and uh, have something for them to uh, stand behind to show that we are actually going to be improving the ecosystem. Grazing has a, a bad name for overgrazing, which is the opposite of what we're doing. We're doing uh, rotational grazing, regenerative grazing. There's all kinds of different names for it, but it's the polar opposite of overgrazing. And so with this proper management of stocking rate and density and duration and time of year, all of these different factors, we can actually improve the ecosystem. And so we are going to uh, hopefully be getting funding to conduct this white paper that's going to prove those things. I'll also say that uh, if we are successful in getting a white paper that uh, is in support of prescribed grazing properly done, then it'll be useful to communities uh, throughout Southern California and Central California. Uh, so we're hoping that that's part of this transferable framework that we're referring to. So with that, I know we're, we went through this very quickly, but also it is getting late in the hour and leave more times for questions. So with that, we can take questions. Okay, we did get a few questions in. So we'll try to answer what we can. Um, the first question is, does animal grazing destroy native plants as well as invasive plants? So uh, because we're able to adjust how many animals we're putting in an area, how big of an area we're giving them at a time, what time of year we're putting them in, we can actually create more biodiversity than before the herd got there. Uh, one example with our partnership with our local land conservancy, the Ojai Valley Land Conservancy, we're specifically targeting certain weed species that germinate earlier in the year, and then they have native amsinkia that are an important wildflower for local birds that germinate later. So when we go in early in the year and we graze the invasives that are coming up, then we pull all the animals out, the natives start to germinate, and they actually have a level playing field because the invasives that would have taken everything over are now starting to regrow at the same time that the natives are germinating. And so we're seeing increased biodiversity with wildflower annuals, and that's obviously going to lead to a, a healthier bird population that relies on those wildflowers. Um, when it comes to perennial species, the goats and sheep in particular uh, tend to prefer the Mediterranean uh, exotic or invasive grasses and forbs like uh, wild oats and mustard 
um, that that are uh, encroaching on native communities. They don't like to eat chaparral or sage scrub communities. Uh, if the occasion calls for it, uh, which is not too often, and we're really trying to create a fire fuel reduction zone um, around a, uh, uh, within 100 feet of a habitable structure, we can leave, put more animals in and leave them longer, and we can get them to impact those native species. But with proper management, we can remove most invasive species without damaging native chaparral or sage scrub communities. Thank you. We have another good question on if there are other jurisdictional agencies such as NPS, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy, participating in these efforts. There's been recent conflicts with brush clearance um, at some locations. Well, I can answer that. We work uh, with a variety of partners. Uh, one, of course, is the Ventura County Fire Protection District. We're closely with them. We work closely with uh, key landowners, such as the Ohio Valley Land Conservancy and Ventura Land Trust. We work with um, uh, other, uh, we work with the UC Cooperative System, we work with the Rangeland Management Advisory uh, Committee, which is the Cal Fire Committee uh, on Rangeland Management work with UCANR uh, and other research uh, researchers. So we, you know, depending on, you know, when we do something like the white paper and actually undertake research, then obviously we're getting more into Native Plant Society uh, and, you know, collaborations with, with UCSB and other, uh, other you know, institutions like that. But so far we have our, our partnerships are both public and private, uh, but include, um, uh, a lot of public agencies that do work directly with us on this program. I also want to add to um, this brings to mind the uh, the challenge in the Conejo Valley with Costco or the Conejo Open Space Conservation Agency. Um, there is an, an old guard of uh, of thinking of, of environmentalism where you you don't touch it, you leave it alone, um, and then there's the new progressive way of thinking where where humans have a place in, in the environment. Um, and so what we're doing is, uh, is land management uh, that's improving the environment. This old way of thinking uh, is that if you're doing anything at all, you're damaging it, let nature take its course. And so the Conejo Open Space Conservation Agency is sort of at the forefront. Um, we, I get a lot of calls from people in Thousand Oaks asking, how can we get these goats in the open space we want to manage this fire fuel. Costco manages so much land in Thousand Oaks, and um, they they have been informed by the Chaparral Institute that is unaware um, at, at our, of our capabilities with targeted grazing, and so they believe that any management is going to be damaging. And so, um, on a local government level, um, that's a good example of challenges that we face in, in uh, our goals is this uh, perspective that we shouldn't uh, touch the environment and leave it alone, um, which I don't think has uh, a place with, with the science that we have now and in this day and age with increasing wildfire frequency and intensity. I also believe that you know what the what the science is showing with the the art and science of restoration is that an area has been already used in the case maybe overgrazed or heavy industrial agriculture or something like this where the native vegetation has been removed uh, and replaced with something else that if that land is left fallow it doesn't get better so once our hand is in it then our hand has to remain in it. I think that's what people are finding around around the world with with restoration of grasslands and other areas. So, for example, an area that may have been overgrazed uh, through uh, you know bad agricultural practices, and it doesn't. Uh, it's sort of it seems counterintuitive, but it isn't. You need actual grazing animals back on the land to help it heal because those creatures evolve together. So those plants and those animals. So it is. But it is, you know, it's not for every place, nor is it a panacea. It's a tool, a highly impactful tool. But again, as we've pointed out, is that these prescriptions are very important. And of course, the skill of the operators. Uh, and so 
One of the challenges that we have in our area uh, is that if we, us and Santa Barbara and other people actually reach the goal we're setting for amount of annual acreage treated, we don't have enough Michaels and Coles and Jack and Jenyas in this in these two counties to do this work. And you need skilled operators to do this. So part of the things we're going after is additional training dollars and, and, and to sort of start to build uh, you know, the industry, uh, because that is a workforce issue. Anything else you want to add to that, Michael? Uh, any more questions? Well, we have ones about the uh, not overgrazing and erosion. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, what is that question here? I can't Can you go back up on the um, chat there. Yeah, I think um, the questions right I'm seeing are, will you guys be studying land erosion, land erosion effects? Um, maybe as part of your, your white paper or, or other studies that you're looking at. Yeah, that's an easy one. Um, it's really just about adjusting stocking rate and density and duration. It's, pre it's pretty intuitive, really, uh, but some, some aspects can be counterintuitive. Often the best way to prevent erosion is to put more animals, not less, for a shorter period of time. If 100 goats are going to clear an acre in a day and you have five acres, you can clear that five acres in a single day with 500 animals. But if you leave 100 animals in there and you're clearing those five acres in five days, those 100 animals are going to find their favorite shade tree and they're going to go to the shade tree every day for five days and maybe wear that tree down. If you're putting 500 animals in, they clear the whole thing out in the day. They enjoy the shade tree for one day and they're moving on, causing less erosion. Um, it's it's uh, things like this that we can adjust to prevent erosion. Yeah, and, and what's implied what Michael was saying is that in, in no cases is it grazed down to bare ground. You no know, bare ground is going to be left. And the fact the residual biomass is part of the prescription that's best suited for that area. Uh, and the fact that, if I'm not mistaken, Michael, that grazing uh, properly done can actually stimulate um, uh, plant growth and root structure. Uh, right. Yeah. So the everything from the chemical reaction of perennial grasses to the saliva of the animals, the amylases in the saliva, the tugging of the grass can encourage uh, root growth. But also at the same time, if we are within 100 feet of a structure, we are capable of taking it down to the dirt. Although from an environmental perspective that could be da damaging behind uh beyond the ignition zone yeah well i added just to what uh, what heidi asked uh, in this white paper we'll be looking at the issue of erosion uh and sediment transport and any you know thing that's in the sediment going to the lake obviously that's a big concern of the bureau of reclamation it's a big concern of the conceded municipal water district that manages the watershed um but, you know, I, you know, anecdotally, I grew up out there. I mean, a lot of that land was owned by my parents before it was uh, taken over by the Bureau of Rec Reclamation. And it was all ag land. It was irrigated pasture lands. It was grazing areas. Uh, it was orchards. It was hay fields. Uh, that's what it was. And ever since that was pulled off 50 years ago, there's been no return of the chaparral or shrub or anything that was removed over 100 years ago. It's now just flashy fuels. And so, we're, and from my perspective growing up out there, and this is something I want to see how this turns out in the white paper with the proper study, is from my, my view of what went on is that those, those streams flowed in those sub basins of you know, Coyote Creek and Santa Ana, they flowed year round. We have big retention ponds everywhere. Now it's just a hard baked landscape out there. So, my feeling is, which I want to see studied in the white paper, is has there actually been degraded watershed function by allowing the land to go fallow uh, and not heal itself? So that's one of the things I'm most curious to see how that turns out. Thank you. Okay. So any other questions? Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to be. Sending, let me send that again. I sent that to just, just the uh, panelists. I'm going to be sending your website to everyone in case they do have any other questions, but um, some of them are getting a little specific. So I want them just to be able to 
contact you directly with their um Yes, you can go to info at firesafehawaii.org and 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 uh, we'll we'll read those submissions and respond as well. Yeah. So if you have any further questions, yeah. So I want to thank everyone for joining and um, definitely for all the interest. This is our most highly attended wildfire speaker series, so we were getting a lot of good questions in. And I will also put my email into the chat as well if you or wishing for, for follow-up information from any of our speakers today. So I want to say thank you very much and thank you to all of our speakers. You guys were very informative. And yeah, we love seeing so many people interested in what they can do to help um, prevent wildfire in the area. So thank you everyone. Thank you. Are we out here?